different things with the Bible. And this is something that we're now at the at the talking about the kingdom of Israel. So this is everything from uh, you know King Saul all the way up until Babylon uh, destroyed Jerusalem and exiled the Jews. Um, so the, quite a quite a few hundred years here, uh, and the problem is with this stage is that we have so much um, archaeology and history that proves the Bible that I'm not even going to mention, but a small piece of it, because you could just go for a week and a week and a week talking about all the different things. It's just it's it's phenomenal. Um, you know, history has really progressed a lot just in a very short time. It's like science. You know, progressed very rapidly in such a very short time. And, um, you know, we went from – we in the in the Western, you know, world went from not knowing anything about Babylon except for what the Bible says to then digging up the remains of these people that the Bible told us about. They were just like they didn't really exist. And so here, you know, now we're looking at all this information, and there's just so much it keeps saying – Yes, the Bible is so so accurate on these things, and so we're not even going to just scratch the surface here. Um, so at, at, up to this point, uh, just a real real quick refresher on some of the um, problems that, that more liberal uh, up, um, people who oppose the Bible – uh, I don't know what to say there, uh, thinkers, um, that, that they're doing. First off is they're holding the Bible to an impossible standard. They're, they're saying, you know, this is the proof that has to exist, you know, and this is what has to happen for the Bible to be validated, but then they've already decided that it's never going to happen. Um, expecting evidence that could never exist, like we already looked at that with, like, for instance, the, um, the Exodus and that kind of stuff, and that's a repeating problem that happens. Believing absolutes about ancient history and archaeology, like okay, um, because we have such a narrow understanding of archaeology, this we just uncovered a few things. That means we know everything. It's like, no, that's just not how it works. Um, and then there's a lot of people, the the grand majority of people that you find posting YouTube comments, for instance, or Facebook comments. It's going to be just complete ignorance of the, of the sad state of ancient history. You know, oh, well, this doesn't make sense to me, so without doing any research about ancient history, I'm just going to say that the Bible is just not true. And it's like, well, the Bible is so well validated and so well recorded, too. It's just amazing. The thing is, a lot of the stuff that they're asking for to exist for the Bible doesn't exist for other ancient records. So they're saying, oh, well, there should be this certain proof, and it's like... That doesn't exist. Like, we looked at this, for instance, at the time of the Exodus. Oh, well, how come there's no papyrus from, from northern Egypt? Well, because there are no papyrus from northern Egypt at all. See what I mean? So you're saying, oh, well, there's none for the Bible. Yeah, that's absolutely true. The Egyptians don't have any, any papyrus in northern Egypt about the, about the Jews. But they don't have any papyrus from anything. So basically, a lot of this is just unfounded objections. We're, we're, oh, well, you know, this is what I think. You know, you, you see it all, all the time. Like, for instance, um, the Bible says this, and it's like, well, no, that's that's something that that translation mistranslated, and it's been since fixed. Um, and then a lot of it's going to be just rhetoric, pretty sounding words that really have no depth to them, and mishandling of the facts. You can literally change any any truth to make it sound like what you want it to say. You can really manipulate the truth. And there's there's really a lot of that kind of stuff that's, that's going on. Um, and then there's the obvious thing that, that people just kind of forget about. You cannot deny historical claims without a basis for denying it. Um, so saying that God did something, and this is something that's kind of important. Saying that God did something doesn't mean that the event didn't happen. Okay? It, if you attribute something to God doing, that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Like, let me give you an example, okay? COVID was caused when God was angry with America or the world or whatever for something, right? Does that mean that COVID didn't actually happen? No, it means that I have attributed COVID to God, right? So it's the same kind of thing with the Bible. The Bible often says that God did this. And so what some people say is they say because it attributes it as a miracle, therefore it didn't happen. Well, it doesn't matter if, some, if something is attributed to God. If, if it happened, it happened, regardless of whether you attribute it to God or Satan or to nothing. 
So everything has a cause. Just because you're saying this was the cause doesn't mean that it's not true. And then another and kind of really important thing here is that the biblical the biblical record, what the Bible says, is not secondary to the Babylonian and Assyrian chronicles. Because a lot of people have this idea. There's secular hist history that would be like Babylon's records, and then there's the Bible, and that's not true. We believe that, that the Babylonians recorded their history as it was done, right? So why should we believe that the Jews didn't do the same? What's there to say that the Bible has to be taken for less than what the Babylonians wrote? There's there's nothing to substantiate that. It's just nonsense. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, the Bible also gives us a lot of good records to other countries as well. You know, like it'll say this king was followed by this one and this one, and it's like, oh, well, that's really cool. And then we compare it to that country's uh, records, and they match up. So let's look at some specific things here. Um, first Kings, and this, this is definitely going to be shortened, but here's just a few people that are uh, mentioned in the Bible that we – have record of. First Kings uh, chapter 16 verse 31 says, and, um, and as it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nabat, he took for his wife Jezebel the daughter of Ithbael king of the Sidonians. Okay, now right there. Jezebel, we have a uh, record of a Jezebel. We don't know if it's the same Jezebel, but that's not really relevant. Let me explain why. Um, it dates to the same time, and it wasn't overly popular for a Phoenician woman to be recorded. So the fact that there was a, pro a prominent Phoenician woman by the name of Jezebel right around the same time, even if it wasn't the same Jezebel, that still argues for this Jezebel having existed because the name was in use at that time. And you know, so, so this is something that kind of is important. <clears throat> And then uh, it, her father is a man named Ithbel. Now, uh, we actually have a record of him. He's mentioned in the uh, Ty Tyrian king list as recorded by Menander of Ephesus. So there's, there's, there's somebody there. Um, in 2 Kings chapter 3, it tells about um, Moab, which is one of the neighboring countries rebelling against Israel. And it mention, mentioned, uh, mentions a guy named Misha. Uh, who, uh, you know, they're, they're doing this fight and everything, and it kind of doesn't go overly well. Uh, moral of the story being, there was actually a stela, which, remember, this is like a big giant rock that has writing on it. Yeah, good enough. Uh, and there was one found there, it's called the Debon stela, or the Misha stela, um, that mentions Omri's dynasty, and it also uh, mentions Misha. So we have record of Omri's family line, so that would be like Omri, Ahab, um, and then we also have record of this same Misha, the, the Moabite king. So this is this is yet another thing. Um, in Second uh, Kings eight three, it has, and I'm going to show you a picture in just a minute of the Misha stela. Uh, eight three in Second Kings. Where is it? There it is. And at the end of the seven years, when the woman returned from the land of the Philistines, she went to appeal to the king for her house and her land. Am I in the right spot? I don't know what I'm what I wrote wrong here, guys. This is the wrong spot. That's that's not right. That's the wrong that's the wrong spot. I don't, I don't know. So I'm gonna just skip that reference, and we'll go to the next one. Uh, Second Kings 13:24 uh, says this: When Hazael, king of Syria, died, Ben Hadad, his son, became king in his place. Okay. Now um, we have quite a few different fragments that verify Hazael being a real person. Uh, there's an ivory fragment from Arslan Tash and Nimrod, and there's one the, there's on the steel of Zach is mentioned there. And his son Ben Hadad, we just we just read about him. He's also mentioned on the Stele of Zakur. Um, and then there's a person named Rezin. If, if you if Second Kings fifteen thirty seven says, um, and obviously I've I've having this is not an exhaustive list of everybody, but 
Um, in those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, against Judah. Now, uh, this guy is actually attributed, but be but because of the two different languages, remember, same king's Hebrew, um, where his name appears is written in cuneiform, so there's that difference. So, long story short, he, he appears as Rakianu, but it's the same guy. Um, it's... It's a whole thing. If you're into linguistics, it would matter to you. I'm not into linguistics, so it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, so we have a record there. And here is the Misha Stele that I was telling you about. That's the one that uh, – about the Misha of Moab. That's that's it right there. It's it's it's, it's bigger than that. <laughs> but uh, anyways, um, so this is just a taste of, of the people that are mentioned. I mean we have proof of them having really existed. And uh, just real quick, um, some things about the kingdom that are worth mentioning that have to do with the dating, just to fill in the gaps when you're reading First and Second Kings or First and Second Chronicles, this will really help you out. Uh, the United Kingdom, so that would have been um, uh, David and uh, Solomon, each reigning uh, 40 years, 1010 to 930. And then uh, the divided kingdom, so when King Solomon died... Uh, his son, King Rehoboam, took place, but then Rehoboam kind of handled the situation terrible, and the kingdom was split into two, the north and the south. There were ten tribes in the north, two tribes in the south. Um, the descendants of King David always ruled the south, and the north had a slew of problems, which we'll look at in just a second. So the divided kingdom existed from 930 to 722. In 722, the north fell. And Judah, which was the name of the southern country, was left alone all the way up until 586. Now, when, Nebu when King Nebuchadnezzar II came, he originally came in, in, came in 605. Well, then, uh, as he was on his conquest, his father died, so he had to quickly go back to Babylon so that he could claim the title of king. And then he ended up coming back down and fighting Egypt. That's not really relevant. They had a real big... Real big battle, things did not go well. And so then he came back in 597 and conquered again. And then in 586 he just said, enough of this, and he wiped Jerusalem off the face of the map. I mean, nothing. It was just ash. So a lot of, lot of, lot of destruction there. Now here's the thing that I wanted to make sure to emphasize to you guys that will really help when you're reading through the Book of Kings, okay? So at two different times, the northern kingdom, Israel, had competing kings. Okay? Now in the book of Kings, it doesn't really draw that much attention to it. It just kind of mentions them one after another, and you just have to figure it out for yourself. Well, thanks to uh, Edwin Thiel, we don't have, you don't have to figure it out. I just can just tell you. <laughs> um, the first one was, if you remember, King Ahab. In, in Israel, he was a very wicked king. His father was King Omri. Okay, Omri is mentioned just a slew of times, but he did not just become king with no hiccups and no problems. Um, he was king at the same time that there were two other kings, King Zimri and King Tibni. Okay, Zimri was only king for seven days, <laughs> and then he got out of there. But then Tibni was kind of a, a, a thorn in, in Omri's side, and so they kind of went back and forth. Omri ended up winning out the day, and so there's that. Uh, then the second time uh, is mentioned actually in the in the uh, prophet Hosea. I can never find Hosea, so you're going to have to give me just a second, okay? There it is. Hosea chapter 5, verse 5, says this. Uh... The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Israel and Ephraim shall stumble in his guilt. Judah also shall stumble with them. Now, this translation is a little bit harder to see, but it's actually talking in plurals here. That there are two different kingdoms in the north that it's talking about. So, if you look at different translations, you're going to see it worded differently. This one just says Israel and Ephraim, but it kind of still gives a little bit of the idea here. The idea is two different kingdoms. So it just so happens that if you look at the Book of Kings, <laughs> well, you find that Menahem and Pekah were actually having a little bit of a two separate kingdoms in the north thing. They each had their own following, and uh, that's how that went. <laughs> but uh, anyways, 
And then the other thing that's kind of important to know, which I'm just going to kind of throw this out there. When you're reading the Book of Kings, it'll make a lot more sense. In the southern kingdom, Judah, there was a king by the name of uh, Amaziah. Uh, if he's in St. Kings chapter 14. And, uh, well, let me just read this real quick. I'll start in verse 11. It says, But Amaziah would not listen, so Jehoash king of Israel went up, and he and Amaziah king of Judah faced one another in battle at Beth Shemesh, which belongs to Judah. And Judah was defeated by Israel, and every man fled to his home. And Jehoash king of Israel captured Amaziah king of Judah, the son of Jehoash, son of Amaziah, uh, at Beth Shemesh, and came to Jerusalem and broke down the wall of Jerusalem for 400 cubits, from the Ephraim gate to the corner gate. And he seized all the gold and silver and all the vessels that were found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house, also hostages, and he returned to Samaria. So right here, what happens, it doesn't really elaborate too much, but then you pick up in chapter 15, and it's talking about his son becoming king, but then there you have like this whole time gap, and it's like, well, what just happened? And it talks about you know, the 15 years and all this stuff that... Um, this king, the king of Israel died 15 years after this, and you're really just like, what's going on here? So let me just kind of break it down here, and then when you read it through, you'll make a lot more sense. Uh, Amaziah was alive but in captivity. So be because he was still technically the king but absent, the people took his son Ahaziah and made him king in his father's place. Well, Amaziah was not killed in captivity. Eventually what happened is his capt captor uh, died, and he was released. And he lived 15 years more, but he didn't become king again. He just kind of slunk off into the south, into the sun, sunset like a cowboy or something. And uh, so anyways, and so Ahaziah reigned in his place. Uh, when you read through, the, through there, it'll be something that you can only really see if you're really paying attention with what it's saying. But if you add up the dates, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So anyways, now through with that, those are the, those are the dating issues you're going to find. Uh, as you read through, we can move on now. Um, the Assyrian and Babylonian kings um, are all very well known. They're very well documented. We have a lot of stuff to prove them. And so when the Bible talks about them, it talks about them in the right order. It talks about them by their by who they actually are. Th these are things that are really important. Um, remember, we didn't have proof of these people even existing except for the Bible. And then we find this stuff, and it's like, oh, it's matching up with what the Bible said. Interesting. Um, okay. Uh, so Omri is mentioned uh, by Moab and Assyria. Ahab is mentioned by Assyria. Hatziel claims... Uh, now, there's this story in St. Kings chapter 9. I'll just, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll, just, I'll read you the, the first part of it. It's verse 14, I think, is the part that I'm going to read. Uh, Thus Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Now, he ends up killing Jehoram... And Ahaziah. He ends up killing both of them. But Hatziel, who's the king of Damascus, claims to have done it. <laughs> and he actually has a, a monument that he he has this. Now you might say, so the Bible's wrong. Hatziel was the one who killed him. Well, no, it was actually very common to claim somebody else's deeds for yourself. It, it, it happens all over in the ancient world. Oh, I did this. And it's like, oh, no, you didn't. Or they'll say, oh, I subjugated them. What that means is they went by their city, and because they didn't fight them, they were afraid. Put that on my inscription. They ran in fear. And it's like, well, not really. You just kind of went by, and they just minded their own business, and whatever. It's just a thing that they did in the ancient world. It's, it, you just laugh and smile. Uh, Jehu, Je Jehoash, Menahem, Pekah, and Hoshea are all mentioned by Assyria by name. Remember, it's Egypt that didn't mention people by names. They mentioned the places that they conquered. Like, uh, I went to southern New Mexico and I conquered Tularosa and La Luz and Alamogordo and Alamorosa. They wouldn't say Margaret Trujillo or whatever the name of the mayor in Alamogordo is. They wouldn't say that. That's not how Egypt rolled. <laughs> they would just give the, the list of the places. Now, Assyria and Babylon, they gave names. You know, so it would say, I went in and, and I made this mayor, this so-and-so, and I made them subjugated. And I went, see, I mean, that's just two different worlds there. Uh, 
But then again, you got one that's in the, you know, uh, what's that called? Uh, Fertile Crescent, and the other one's all the way over in Africa, so. Um, anyways, Joram the Senkin is mentioned by Hatziel. That same Hatziel, who's, you know, that guy. Um, now, that takes us to Hezekiah. Now, I already told you about the dating issues and how the Bible seems to have an error in saying that uh, Hezekiah was... Let me think. It's like 20, 20 years or so um, <coughs> before he was actually king. Well, remember, if you remember, I said I don't really think that the Bible's wrong on this one. I think that he was just the um, the co uh, co ruler, and that the Bible just called him the king just to draw attention to the fact that he was king while all this nonsense was happening because it was trying to emphasize his righteousness. Besides his father's and his son's immorality. So, anyways, uh, but this is actually a very well-documented thing. The only thing is that the Bible gives a, um, a sweeping statement about some of it, and then the Assyrian record gives a different sweeping kind of thing. And so you get these, it sounds like they're contradicting each other, but not really, just from the perspective. You have to take in their own perspective. Um, obviously, the, King, the Book of Kings is going to be more interested with the Israelites, and the Assyrians are going to be more interested with the Assyrians. In, in their eyes, they're the main hero of the story. You know, see what I mean? So you have to take that into account. So as for Hezekiah the Jew, I leveled the cities around him with battering rams and siege engines. I gave them to the king of Ekron instead. I took off 200,000 of his people and animals without number. Himself, like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem. You see, he never actually claims to have conquered him. That's really funny. He never actually says what the outcome of this was. And so what about a reference of losing, you know, 185,000 soldiers? Uh, well, he just kind of ignores it. Completely doesn't mention it. Why? Because that's not much for a morale boost. Oh yeah, we lost 185,000 soldiers. Wow, that must have been an epic battle. There was no battle. We were just surrounding the city, and we all died. Wow. <laughs> so uh, it, Assyria does mention about how uh, Hezekiah tried to pay him off. The Bible mentions that too. There's no contradiction there either. Um, we do have a little bit of an interesting reference. Herodotus, who was a historian, long story short, uh, says that what happened was they had a rodent infestation – and it was chewing up their their arrow or bow strings, and so they had to leave because of the uh, rat infestation, which we can read between the lines and say there might have been the possibility that God caused a rat infestation that caused sickness that caused them to die. God could have done that. Now, we don't know ultimately. All we know is the angel of the Lord acted. That's all it says. How did he act? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. But whatever it was, there was a major miracle going on here. Because whatever force or whatever means God used to kill 185,000 soldiers, it didn't even make the people in Jerusalem sick. I mean, that is a miracle, guys, that, that there are all these soldiers, they all die, and Jerusalem is completely scot-free. I mean, that, that's just amazing. Uh, anyways. Um, <laughs> burst into flames ah! <laughs> or if you've seen like those old movies like uh, the old Indiana Jones where like their eyes all melt down it's all super, super cheesy like um, a Play-Doh you know? <laughs> uh, anyways um, so the Bible and, and other sources they don't contradict they just give a fuller picture in two different perspectives and the problem is is that if you go to it with this, with this mentality everything that the Assyrians say is true Everything that the Bible says is wrong. Well, you've already decided that there can be no no rectifying these two accounts. No. They just no. One's right and the other one's wrong. See what I mean? You've already put a limit on history. Well, that's not how history works. It doesn't work to your own personal preference. History is something that you have to learn from. It's not it's like the Bible. You can't go to it saying, I already know what to believe. It's like, well, that's that's not really how it works. You, you have to ha have the ability to admit, maybe what I believe is wrong. Now, obviously, as Christians, I'm not telling you to abandon your faith. But sometimes, I mean, I'm talking about myself here. You know, I'll believe something, and then I'll read it, and I'll be like, oh, 
you know, I believed this my whole life, and that's just not what this is actually saying. Like, I'll give you an example. There was a guy who um, had never read the Bible through his whole life, and so finally he did read the Bible through, and he said, did you know that it never actually says that um, cleanliness is next to godliness? He didn't know that because he'd never read the Bible through. And his so, always told him. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, as far as this, the Bible kind of attaches it as a very close thing. He left there and was instantly killed by his sons. That's because the Bible doesn't really care what was going on in Assyria. It really just doesn't care. The point of Kings is to show the purpose of, of righteousness and, <laughs> and those kinds of things. It, it's not going to detail every single thing that happened in Assyria. Once again, this is not saying that the Bible is wrong. It just wasn't interested in giving all the details before. I believe it was somewhere around 20 years before he died. Maybe it was like 10 or 20 years. But yes, his sons did come and kill him while he was offering sacrifices to his god, which is kind of ironic. And the Assyrian records, I mean, this is something that's, that's verified. Um, and then his other son, who did not uh, assassinate him, Ezra Hodden, did become the king, just like the Bible says. And I believe he ended up, ch ended up chasing down those two brothers and killing them. I'm not positive about that because I'm a little bit vague on that. Um, it's been a while since I, I, I read that area of history. But mm, something like that. I want to say that that's what he did. So in all of this, there's a few kind of people and characters that kind of fall through the cracks that I want to mention. Uh, the first carries a lot of um, controversy with him. Uh, he's known by some as Shishak. First uh, Kings chapter 14. And he's known by others as Shashank. 14, 25 through 26 says this, In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, who is King Solomon's son, okay, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. So obviously there's the problem that there is no Pharaoh Shishak. Well, that's because, once again, two different languages. This shouldn't concern us. It, that's just going to be something that happens. Not only that, but Pharaohs also had uh, throne names and then their regular names, so they had multiple names. Okay, so don't forget that. And then they'd also attach all kinds of things to their name. Like one of his inscriptions um, says, Shashank, the beloved of Amun, or something like that. Uh, so it's this long, whole long name, and it's not really his name. It's just you know his title and all this stuff. So, uh, okay, so Shishak, in all likelihood, is Shashank. That's obviously debated, but there's really no basis for the for the debate. Um, it's it's pretty much for sure. I mean, there's such a small chance that it's not the same guy. This is more of the story being uh, Shashank is linked with Palestine. He does have ties with Palestine. The main problem that people have is they say something along the lines of this. And if you ever get involved with any kinds of discussions about the kings, you're going to hear this. They're going to say, well, his records does not specifically say that he came up against Jerusalem. Now, hold on. 1 Kings 14, 25-26, and it says there in verse 26, um, or 25, uh, came up against Jerusalem, and then 26, he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the, of the king's house, he took away everything. He also took away all the shields of gold that Solomon had made. So here's the thing. The record that he has, I believe it's at Karnak. Mm, I don't remember. I believe his record of this is at Karnak. Don't, don't quote me on that, though. It's massively damaged. It's missing a bunch of lines. And so it doesn't mention Rehoboam because Egypt didn't mention kings' names. We remember that, right? And it doesn't mention Jerusalem because, well, maybe it did mention Jerusalem, and we just lost that piece. Moral of the story being, Shashank came through, and he started just, like, decimating Israel's fighting forces and the Palestine just to kind of bring them a little bit of humble pie, I think, and uh, remind them, you know, who was boss. <laughs> and uh, then he gets to Jerusalem, and they say, okay, here's some gold. Go away now. And that's how that went. <laughs> I'm like, once again, that that's only going to be a contradiction if you've already decided the Bible's wrong. But there's no reason to say that, especially when you're dealing with ancient history. You're you're dealing with, you know, well, this guy wrote one aspect of this one conquest. I mean, like for instance, you have some pharaohs where it says, you know, we have half of a reference where it says something about he had a campaign in Syria against who? When did he have this? What happened? Like, and nothing else. We just, you know, just a brief glimmer of something. So, you know, there's that. Um, so apparently he wasn't going just for Jerusalem. He was going to kind of weaken the whole area. Um, 2 Kings 23, 29. Another little, little thing here.
case. It says, In his days Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. Uh, king Josiah went to meet him, and Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo as soon as he saw him. Now, this this really does add up because this Pharaoh Necho was, um, was in an alliance with the Assyrian king. But at this time, now this is what I mean by it adds up. All the dates match perfectly with what we know. In 609, uh, the, the, the last remnants of Assyria, I believe it was under Asher Ubalit, was fighting against the rising, the rising Babylonian threat. And they were really ready to be wiped out. And Egypt was his ally. So he was coming up to try and help Assyria so that they could prevent Babylon from doing their takeover. Well, obviously, we know that Nebuchadnezzar II won that day, don't we? <laughs> um, let's see, what else was I going to say about that? Um, and so th this, this um, Josiah tries to go and stop this. Well, in some of your older translations, it's going to say something along the lines of this. That King Necho was going up against, against Assyria. Well, that didn't make much sense historically. Well, that's because it was a mistranslation. It, it sh if you notice the ESV... The ESV sa says to, as, as in going up to, going to help. And uh, this was actually something that was found out in uh, some of the manuscripts that we were using. Um, another, th another reason why the King James just really isn't worth reading anymore is it's just, it, it hasn't stood the test of time. They did what they could when they could, but now that we have access to better records, more accurate b copies of the Bible, there's no reason to hold on to something that's been proven wrong. Uh, anyways, um, 2 Kings 24, 1-2, in his days, Nebuchadnezzar, this is King Nebuchadnezzar II, the one that everybody knows, uh, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant for three years, and he turned and rebelled against him. Now, that obviously begs the question, why? Why did why did he rebel? Well, this is actually what I was talking about, that, that massive conflict that Egypt and Babylon had. It decimated both sides. Like, I mean, Egypt and Babylon were so greatly weakened that they didn't even really do anything. They both kind of just went home and didn't go on any campaigns for like two years. I mean, it just did, it didn't go well for anybody. And uh, so then Jehoiakim, he's like, ha-ha. I, I see my opportunity. Babylon is finally on, on the downswing. Now is my opportunity to rise up against them. Well, it turned out to be a, a bad gamble because uh, King Nebuchadnezzar was not on the downswing. He was able to recover. He came back through and subjugated, uh, which is, once again, remember how I said that there are three different conquerings of Jerusalem. This was one of the conquerings. I think this one was the 597, I believe. Uh, anyways, so Egypt and Babylon. Okay, I already said that. All right. So, here's something that you need to remember when you're reading the Bible. The Bible is not bare history. So, a lot of times you'll hear people talking about uh, objective history nowadays, right? As, as if that's even a thing. The idea is to try and find just the facts of what happened, which is impossible, because everything's always tainted with bias. But assuming that you could, and, you know, yeah, but the Bible is not even interested in that. It doesn't even claim to be interested in that. It, it says it's not even interested in that. You know, it, it keeps going on these divergence about this was why Israel fell, because they did this and this. And it makes absolutely certain that you understand. It's not giving bare history. It's giving an interpretation of it. In case you missed what happened, this happened because they did this. I don't know if you missed that, but let me explain it for you. That's what, the, that's what its purpose is. So if you're looking for something that just gives... Historical fact, nothing else. Then don't look in the Bible because the Bible isn't interested with you just knowing stuff. It wants to change you. Uh, the Bible is, I mean, honestly, I'm blown away by the Bible, not just by the way that it all just fits together, but by the way that it has such power. And it's so simple of a book, but it has such power behind it. It, it blows me away every time. Anyways, um, <clears throat> another thing that I that is kind of uh, overlooked is uh, King Ahab's death. Now, before King Ahab died, he joined in a force, uh, and they fought at what's called the Battle of Karkar. Um, and uh, it didn't go great, but, um, I mean, I guess it could have gone worse, too. And 
it ended with um, one of Ahab's um, homies in the alliance had way worse uh, losses than Ahab did. So Ahab thought, now is a pretty good time to get rid of this guy. So he tries to get uh, the king of Judah to join him, and the king of Judah says, okay, let's do it. So then they, they, they ask some prophets you know, for help, and the prophets say, yeah, go and conquer. Yeah, everything will be fine. And then the king from Judah says, this, something's off. Let's get, let, do you have any other prophets? And he's like, okay, there's this one guy. Don't really like him. He doesn't really like me. We just kind of have a, have a, you leave me alone and I won't kill you kind of thing going on. And they're like, okay, well, let's go ahead and call him. So they call him and he says, yeah, uh, you go, hey, go conquer. And they're like, okay, I know you've been sarcastic. Just tell me the truth. And he's like, okay, you're going to die. And all these prophets are lying to you. And uh, it was a deceiving spirit that they're all lying to you. So go, go and die. And uh, and so then they say, well, I didn't really like that. So the prophet obviously, prophets obviously get upset at the guy. Long story short, they go off um, to try and wipe out their other ally that they're kind of just sick of. <laughs> and uh, and instead, the king of Judah ends up dying because he dressed up like Ahab. But their enemies are like, don't even mess with his army. Just kill him. Go for Ahab. Whatever it takes, just kill him. And so they're going for the guy, and not knowing that it's the king of Judah. So the king of Judah gets mortally wounded too. And then Ahab dies anyways by just some stray arrow, just a complete funk accident. Complete out of the blue kind of thing, like, ha ha, uh, uh, you know, that's kind of the end of that. And uh, and so this is, this is how that ends. And why does the Bible not mention the Battle of Karkar, which historically was a much more significant battle? Because it's not interested in what was the precursor to Ahab's arrogant death. It's not interested. It's trying to show the way that Ahab was constantly doing the wrong thing instead of listening to God. He never did the right thing. He always did whatever God didn't want him to do. Well, then he it climaxed in his death. So it's not really important about the Battle of Karkar, which was that same year of his death. But not not important for, for the story. But anyways, um, so that, that kind of just, just clarifies that. Um, like I said, if I were to tell you every little piece of, of thing that, that, that proves the, the, this period of the Bible, guys, we'd be here for weeks. There's steles, there's, there's, there's inscriptions, there's all kinds of different things. Uh, and it's just, I mean, it's just everywhere. I mean, you, you see people validated and validated and validated, and, and, and it, the Bible is just so spot on, it's scary. It's like the people were actually there. <laughs> So next week, next week we're going to start looking at um, the time of the exile and the prophets because there's some things there that we need to talk about. So any questions? Was there anything about the kings or the kingdom that, that maybe you want me to talk about next week before we move on? No? Okay. All right. We'll go ahead and stop there then.